So, I don't know how to admit this, but one of my personal favorite genres in gaming is open world games in general. I'm a sucker for open world games in general. I've been a big fan of games like Grand Theft Auto, Far Cry, and even Watch Dogs out of all things. I've always really liked the idea and the concept of an open world, and I feel like most games in the past decade or so have actually, you know, innovated on this idea, and I think we've gone to a point where open world games are maybe at, at their best. I mean... Stuff like The Witcher 3, Grand Theft Auto 5, and all these other great open world games kind of shows how much we have come in terms of open world games when you compare it to something like Grand Theft Auto San Andreas or Grand Theft Auto 3. We have come a long way. But as of late, however, I've been putting some time into some recent open world games that came out in 2017. Now, I'm going to be honest, I didn't play many games in 2017, but I recently picked up Middle Earth, Shadow of War, and Ghost Recon Wildlands. Now, these games are fine for the most part. I've been, you know, enjoying them both, you know, sort of. But one thing became really apparent to me when I was actually playing both of these games, especially after 10 hours of playing Ghost Recon Wildlands. I don't know why, but recent open world games have seemed to have lost their appeal in the world they are built in. And the best way I can describe it is that whenever I play Ghost Recon Wildlands, whenever I see a side objective or mission... I just feel like it's just busy work. It's a similar story with Shadow of War with the whole main mission unlock system and it's based around your nemesis system so you've got to build up your army in Shadow of War, you got to, you know, gather up, or gather, gather up orcs and it kind of just feels like busy work sometimes. It's like you're being forced to do this in order to progress for the, through the story and that's not how games should not be designed. And the worst part is, is that both of these games have really beautiful open worlds, especially Ghost Recon Wildlands. Ghost Recon Wildlands, I dare say, has some of the best, like, like if you like looking at a landscape on the highest settings possible, is one of the most beautiful games I've ever played. It is really good. But the problem is, is that especially with Wildlands, it feels copy and pasted and it's, and it's really evident with Ghost Recon Wildlands. With Shadow of War, it's not as often because of the environmental shifts in the environment and that stuff like that but it still feels copy and pasted and there is variation in different places like for example in ghost recon you have you know salt plains and in middle earth you have um you have like snowy areas of, like different environments but they all just feel similar they don't feel unique whatever and the reason why i'm using the term unique is because some of the best open world games i've played in played in the past decade or so, have very specific design choices in order to make the worlds feel engaging and fun enough for the user that they will go out, do side objectives, and get more out of the game, which is what games are, which is what the open world game is all about. And this is what I'm going to be exploring today. I'm going to be exploring what makes an open world game good and how you should, you know, go around designing an open world game if you're going to or if you're, you know, going to be, you know, some business executive in the next five years or something. I just want to kind of give you a reference of what, in my eyes, makes a great open world game. So I'm going to be using three main examples of open world games to give you a reference of what good open world design is. So in no particular order, I've got Grand Theft Auto 5. This choice is pretty obvious. It is one, still one of the, it still sells like hotcakes. This this game is absolutely incredible, even though the online mode's a bit shit, but we don't talk about that. But the story mode of the game is absolutely fantastic. And I've also got Watch Dogs 2. Now, Watch Dogs 2 kind of flew under the radar because the first one was really negatively received. But Watch Dogs 2, as an open world game with all the stealth mechanics and just everything around it, it is one hell of a great open world game. It's one of the best open world games I've played, you know, last year, even though the game came out in 2016, I only picked it up in 2017. And finally, I've got The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This one's pretty self-explanatory. It's The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. It is such a massive open world game, and it took me a year and a half to finish this, and I feel really, really bad about it. So all of the games I've just me mentioned inhibit most of the features and game de design elements that actually make an open world game really, really enjoyable. So I'm going to be talking about the first thing and one of the most essential things about an open world game is the location and how you make use of it. So this doesn't mean the game has to be, you know, outright pretty, but the game needs to have recognizable locations. And what I mean by recognizable is that, you know, if the best example I can think of is in Grand Theft Auto 5, whenever you're driving in Grand Theft Auto 5, even after 
after a couple of hours, you start to recognize, you start to know where you're going, even without looking in the minimap. Like for example, you want to go to the airport, you know, you could kind of, you know, vision out where you need to go. And that's because Grand Theft Auto 5's world is very, very well designed and it's very unique. So if you think of a way to get somewhere, it probably, you know, is, you know, a possible way to get there. Now, one of the most common symptoms that a lot of open world games inhibit, especially Ubisoft ones, is that a lot of the buildings look the damn same. And the reason for this is that it saves time. You could just reuse the same assets, put, you know, a couple of things on it. And the problem with this is that you often feel like you're always traveling in the same village or area, even though, you know, you might be climbing halfway through the country. A good example of this is The Crew. Now, The Crew was an open world racing game that was surprisingly a Ubisoft game. And you essentially was set all over the state. And the problem was, was that all, even in all the major cities, they were all using copy and pasted assets. So even if you were in like Los Angeles, New York, it just all felt like the same pace. There was no unique kind of, you know, idea. It all just felt copy and pasted, which wasn't great. Now, now, the three games um, that I've mentioned earlier d deal with this sort of situation in many different ways. Like, so with Grand Theft Auto 5, you have key zones of the map where you can recognize it. So for example, in Grand Theft Auto 5, you've got the Vinewood area, which is like the rich part of town with features like the Vinewood sign, the, you know, the multi-million dollar mansions and the rich expensive shops around that area. It feels like a real place. And you also have like the low income areas of the cities where you've got like massive industrial areas, you know, projects, You've also got lots of dark alleyways. And finally, you've got the massive desert, which is north of the map, which is full of hillbillies, monster trucks, and just generally crazy stuff. And one of the reasons why the open world in this game is praised so much is that it's so recognizable, you know, when which era you in. And this is actually helped by the characters because there are three different characters and each three characters kind of represent a different location. You've got Michael, who represents kind of a rich kind of just arsehole in general. You've got Franklin, who is kind of growing up in the project so you've also got Trevor who is just Trevor and he's just a hillbilly but the thing is is that the game does this so so well and you don't even notice it but this really helps with building the atmosphere of the game and the open world. Watch Dogs 2 does a similar thing it has key zones so for example you could tell if you're in Silicon Valley or downtown San Francisco or you know a you know a low income area. Now what it also does because in Watch Dogs 2 you can profile NPCs and it will essentially give you information about all these NPCs and the best part about this mechanic is that what they tend to do is they tend to spawn NPC NPCs that represent that area so for example if you go in a street full of homeless people you'll get you know profiles of homeless people you see you know how they've gotten to that point and it's actually quite an interesting game mechanic because you can actually learn a lot about you know the game's world and how you know people are ending up in these situations and it's actually just generally just a really interesting idea and the game also the game also feels like San Francisco because of the sandbox style. It's got all the internet of things stuff. So for example, it's got traffic lights, barriers, and all this stuff is connected, you know, into the city, like the real San Francisco because Silicon Valley is near there. And this game is trying to kind of parody it. So in Watch Dogs 2, you could control everything like traffic lights, barriers, and there's so much you could do, but it makes it such a unique experience. The Witcher 3 does a very similar thing too, if I'm honest. There are four different hub worlds in the main in the main game, not ex excluding, you know, the DLC, which adds like hundreds of hours of content. You've got, you know, the capital cities like Novigrad and Skalliger. There is so much there. And the world building is helped by the story since the cities kind of open up to you as you continue to progress through the game story. And it really helps that there's some really, really cleverly done side quests. So you kind of learn about the, you know, the cities and, you know, there's some of their issues and some of their racial issues. And it's quite an interesting way to do a video game. Number two, the open world map design needs to match with the gameplay. And one of the things that is essential, you know, in an open world game is the mechanics of the game needs to match the world. So the best way I can describe it, imagine if, you know, a game like Super Mario Odyssey or Zelda Breath of the Wild had the world of Grand Theft Auto V. It simply wouldn't work. And the issue is, is that this, this issue is still relevant in, you know, some open world games. For example, Ghost Recon Wildlands has a problem with the level design and it's like for most of the levels, it's really, really difficult to do a stealth play style. And what I mean by difficult, there are times where it's just downright impossible. And this is probably because of the scale of the game is absolutely huge. 
but it just really ruins the game for me. And you're pretty much always forced to go loud at points and it just makes the game really, really unfun. And what makes it worse is that because of the four player, the four, the, you could have four players in one match at the same time. It kind of just, it just ruins it in my eyes. Now, the good news is that the three open world games I mentioned earlier do this really, really well. So with Grand Theft Auto 5, the world matches well with the gameplay. There's a lot of cars to rob and steal and the game itself is a hyper real life parody of real life so you could do cool like things you can rob a bank you could do a street race you could go to the strip club you could shoot up a place you could hunt animals you shouldn't you could hijack our aircraft and there's so much to do in Grand Theft Auto 5 that is probably illegal and it helps that this game has a really accessible control scheme especially with controllers because one of the things I've noticed every time I get anyone to play Grand Theft Auto 5 even if they've never you know picked up a controller in their life it's really easy to just to start driving because it's very very obvious controls and the best part is that once you learn to drive you know one vehicle you can pretty much drive all of them and it kind of all follows the same sort of control scheme so it kind of helps that Grand Theft Auto 5 has a really cleverly designed control scheme. Watch Dogs 2 is a sandbox hacking game so the open world design revolves around that so you can control all sorts of things like traffic lights, cars, forklifts, elevators, phones, and lots of other stuff. And the feature that really ties the experience in Watch Dogs 2 is the profile profiling feature that I talked about earlier. You can see any NPC NPC's profile in the fictional CTOS system. So it'll give you stuff like, you know, their salary, their job, and maybe, you know, something major that's happened to recently. It'll even tell, tell them their mood at the time because you can actually change their mood in, you know, in game. So this system was, you know, it was actually the first game, but they heavily expanded it in Watch Dogs 2. And the best part about this is that there is so much variance of what you could actually get. So you can peek into people's private conversations. You can dial their phone to make them angry. And, and it's like there is so much different like algorithms and just general variances that it just becomes really interesting just to kind of, you know, break the break the template and just see what happens when an NPC does this or if you do that to them. And my personal favorite feature in this game is how the NPCs react to certain things certain things. So for example, if you control a NPC's car and get it to drive into another car, what will sometimes happen is either the NPC will run, a, run away to, you know, obviously avoid insurance fraud, or they will start beating up the person they literally just drove into. And it's kind of like an entire fight and the police get called in. It's a really, really interesting experience that I highly recommend just like even watching some videos because it's such an awesome thing to witness. And I think it's one of the best things about Watch Dogs 2. It's just its variance and just general open world design and how the world matches with the gameplay and it's just really really unique. The Witcher 3 does its game design justice with the open world. Now, with The Witcher 3, it's an RPG, it's got lots of side quests, storylines, and all these side quests and storylines are plotted throughout this vast open world. And the game has a lot of useful mechanics to make, you know, the third person combat just the general immersive experience better. So, one well, of the best examples of this is that whenever you're talking to NPCs, the subtitles actually show up above their head on the characters. And this is really, really useful because in The Witcher 3, especially, you constantly have, you know, NPCs and other people will talk to you at like even at the same time so you can sometimes just hear lots of different things and it's just nice to know that you could just you know read the subtitles instead of listening to them so if you just want to focus on one conversation you can do that and it makes the game just feel you know a much more personalized experience and the game also has some mechanics that make third person combat better especially one of the best ways is that the the trees and the objects fade out of the background if it's blocking your camera this is actually an issue that is not just prevalent in third person and combat action games. It's actually prevalent in platformers and I can't believe The Witch 3 is one of the first games to figure it out where you could just fade out the trees and other objects that might be blocking your view because you know you know you actually have to you know you know chop a guy up to bits. It's absolutely awesome and it really makes the game feel like a you know a true you know an ultimate RPG experience. Guess what I should not use true but anyways number three the most important rule is that the, the one of the reasons why the open world game has always been really appealing to me is the idea of exploring the world and doing side stuff. And one of the most important things is that doing side stuff and exploration needs to be rewarding and enjoyable and not like busy work. And this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, introducing a new gameplay mechanic or making, you know, a really awesome level for a side quest. It could be tackled in many, many different ways. And each game actually does it in a very 
very unique, different way. So in Grand Theft Auto 5, the game has a lot of side stuff you could do. You, like I said, you could, you know, do loads of, you know, illegal-like stuff. But the game actually has hobbies. And one of the reasons why the hobbies are quite rewarding is that you get to do it with characters that you might like or hate. And also you get stat boosts and money sometimes, depending on how you do the hobbies. And also the side quests in the game could give you a lot of information about your favorite characters. One time, you could be learning about, you know, Trevor's parents and everything, everything like that. Or another time you could just be racing against some crazy, you know, gym woman or something. And the thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to th this game especially, it uses comedy and satire to make the side quests really, really enjoyable. I mean, they reward you with comedy essentially in Grand Theft Auto V, and I think that's a really smart idea, and it makes for some really, really enjoyable exploration. Watch Dogs 2, on the other hand, rewards you with something a little different. So a lot of side quest stuff is not on the minimap to do. You usually have to hack or look at someone's phone in order to find the side quest usually. And once you find the side quest, you know, a, you know, a phone conversation will trigger and you will, you know, be asked, you know, oh, you know, hack this person or just do this. Now, the thing is, is that these side quests are usually incredibly short. I wouldn't mean by short. Some of them are usually only for 10 minutes. So usually they only require you to, you know, get up to one place and just hack a little main mainframe theme thing. Now the best part is, is actually the result you get because usually you get an interactive cutscene where you can mess with someone to sometimes you'll be able to mess with a swatter or an evil corporate guy or just something that's just generally just quite, you know, about you essentially you get to, you know, rob the rich and it's actually quite, quite fun to watch. And one of the things that makes the side quest enjoyable in this game is that the people you attack and ruin in this game are actually satirical parodies of people in the tech industry. For example, one of the first side quests in the game literally parodies the Martin Shkreli situation. And just to let you know, Martin Shkreli is a terrible, terrible man. And what he did was, was that for the new Wu-Tang Clan album, he um, purchased it um, for him only. So it's essentially, it was a one time thing he purchased it for I think it was like one million dollars or something crazy like that and in this game they kind of parody it but this time they actually you know get they actually hack the CD and he also rob all of Martin Shkreli's money and puts it into charity and it just kind of takes the piss out of it and a lot of the other side quests do a similar thing and I don't really want to spoil anything else because they do a lot more satirical parodies on tech companies you know tech companies like Google and you know EA and just lots of other cool stuff it is a really really cleverly well-written game and a lot of the side quests are just really really fun to do. The Witcher 3 does side quest exploration in a really really rewarding way and this is because I often find myself doing side quests that feel like the main story quest and the reason why is because the side quests in The Witcher 3 feel so they because they all tie in into the main story so sometimes it's just worth it to do the side quest because you get you learn more about your favorite characters and you can uh, you could choose if you want to help out Triss or you know Yennefer or you can choose to pretty much help anyone out you want and it's a really really interesting mechanic and some of the best side quests in the game are like you know are, I would probably say some of the side quests in the game are probably better than the main story they are really really good they have the same production values as the main story which is an achievement in itself and i've never and even Watch Dogs to a grand theft auto 5 even their side quests are good but they're not as good as you know some of the main story stuff the witcher 3 somehow manages to make the side quest just as enjoyable as the main story because it has the same production value it has the same sort of impacts that the main story would and considering how the game is almost a hundred hours long I consider this probably one of the best open world games I've ever played. Anyways, I hope this video has given you an idea of what what I would like to see in an open world game. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys, what would you like to see in an open world game? Anyway, it's been Effect signing out. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know I've been absent for a while, but I've been planning to make some more videos. I have my update video if you want to watch it. I'll see you guys later. Peace.